trap, 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 trap. <laughs> Welcome everyone, so hola para mi gente, welcome, welcome and welcome your host Taino and for the third time we do have a big honor on our session 21, Gene Decode, so Gene, welcome from the mountain area. Thank you Taino, it's always uh, so wonderful to be on your platform, it's the people are so informed here and knowledgeable and such really thought provoking and deep question. And it's always unique every time and different. And I feel so privileged to be back. So thank you, Taino. Same here. And uh, to the people, just to let you know, we're going to tackle uh, various topics from the uh, latest intel of genes on the DOMS operation, you know, below the continental United States. Uh, what's really, you know, an advance uh, information of the dumps below Toronto and Lock Ontario. We're going to tackle as, as well what we saw several weeks ago uh, within what we call indigenous people, Canada land, but, you know, Canada, uh, the fact that graves has been, you know, uh, disclosure uh, to the public. And Gene's going to break down, you know, how public assassination, how they are being designed, you know, and the plot. So without further ado, I want Gene to share one of his healing techniques, especially with his latest personal events. So Gene, please go ahead and share this to us. Yeah, thank you so much, Tino. So I've been having a horrific Mergellans attack. I'm finally uh, getting uh, on top of it due to a lot of things I've learned and lots and lots and lots of research of what works and what doesn't work. And uh, it was long because I try one thing, it'd make me worse. I try another thing, it'd make me better because the things I'd done before weren't working as well because this is a totally different, turns out different type of uh, critter than what I've dealt with before. The AI that I had for the Mergellans, which is the fibers and the nano spiders and the nanotech and the smart dust and all of that, that they put in through Operation Indigo Skyfall for a couple of decades in our chemtrails and in our water supply as well. Um, that when you do a uh, liver gallbladder saltwater cleanse, which I've been doing those for 30 years, they're really good way to keep your health. Uh, once a month, you do a, I do a saltwater cleanse and then uh, I drink um, two quarts of water uh, each quart with one level tablespoon of a good salt like Redmond salt's the best one I know of. Uh, after I boil the water, I distill water, uh, or you need to either have distilled or a very purified water with no fluorine and chlorine in it. And that's another thing I found out about this is bathing. I can't bathe in the outbreak areas. You get lesions and it outbreaks the fibers and stuff come out through your skin and it creates lesions. You can't get regular tap water on that or burns like fire. And previously what I had did not like the sun. What I have now, if I go out and I haven't been out in sunlight until the sun goes below the horizon, it's dusky, uh, twilight. I haven't been out in sunlight since I found that out because it just burns like somebody threw acid over me where the lesions and things are, they feed off of it. So I learned quite a bit of things. Um, one is the hay bath when I do that is to wash the hay and don't, I used alfalfa powder and that doesn't pull them out. It gets inside your skin and it fuels them. And I, it made me incredibly worse. Another thing I've done as an EMP before um, since I don't have the guy that built the big huge EMP device down in New Mexico, the cabal killed him and took his plans and took his machines and threatened his wife and his daughter to, you know, make sure they got everything. Mm -hmm. So since I don't have that, I have an old Honda Civic, you know, that's less voltage and I get the engine running and then I detach the spark plug wire one and put a screwdriver and do a, you know, feet to the ground and ground myself and send it, you know, not through my heart, but through my arm and through my body in different locations to EMP them and shut down the program. And that works. Well, the friend of mine where I have my Hondas out, which is about an hour drive, um, he had got it previous, you know, to this last outbreak mine. I went out there and did that and I felt better. And then I was getting ready to leave. And he said he had, he used his microwave and I'm like, 
they actually could put stuff in your head because my voice, which was now in the background compared to the stuff that Mergellans is putting in my head, said, no, they live off microwave energy. You're going to feed them. And in the foreground was, yeah, let's go ahead and try that. <laughs> so stupidly, I listened to that. I went in and this was unique too, because usually when it starts, I get the feeling of a, a headache so bad that on the back of my skull, it feels like somebody has a vice grip clamped on the gallbladder 20 point at the, the fossa at the bottom of each side of your spine on the bottom of your skull. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any headache. But when I started rotating in front of this microwave, I got a, started getting a headache. And then like 15 minutes drive away from his home, I started having like the feeling of fire ants crawling all over me. And then I thought again, my voice in the background, I need to turn around and go redo the car, the spark plug. And they, they you know, they say, you know, override it and go, no, you'll be fine. It's just, you know, the sun and you're out in the sun and you're sweating and the sweat's getting in the, in the lesions and burning. So I didn't turn around and I went back the next day. So that made it worse. And then I started getting better with Jim Humble's protocol 1000. And then um, after trying that, uh, doing that, then I went back the next morning and got the spark plug again, went home. And then I, you know, kept doing uh, protocol 1000 it wasn't getting better so i thought i would do a four-day liver gallbladder saltwater cleanse which every time i've done that it's really powerful and was this time too as you do the first day you do the saltwater cleanse and you follow it up with the liver gallbladder cleanse which is you take um, every two hours you make up five glasses of water with four level tea tablespoons of epsom salt and then you take one glass each two hours after you finish the regular salt water. And then right before bed on the, you save the fifth glass for the morning, right before bed, two hours after the last glass of the fourth glass, you do a uh, glass of uh, three fourths strained pink grapefruit juice that you squeeze. And I use the rind later and I use a potato peeler and take all the pith, the white stuff on the inside out. And I boil that with an inch of water over it for 20 minutes and you, that with a lid on it. And that gives you HCQ to quinine water. And I use that an ounce every morning after you, you get, let it cool and pour it off. And then I use that for a week that helped a lot too. Um, then once you do in a three fourths of glass of the pink grapefruit juice with a half a glass of extra virgin olive oil, shake it up and chug it. And then you go to bed and get up in the morning and you drink the last glass and you'll have lots of stones coming out of your liver. And if you mm -hmm. have a gallbladder, that as well. And then um, after that, um, I just start the next salt water cleanse. So that's the second day, the third day, the fourth day, usually by the fourth, third or fourth day. And in this case, it was the fourth day, you get the hatcheries out. The hatcheries look like if you've ever seen a puffball mushroom that you stomp on, all the spores come out. It's about the size of a golf ball. It's white. It's like that. Uh, like you kind of broke it open and the spores are out and you get those out of your gut. But this time, that's not what I got. This time, what I got is the same size, but it's kind of an opaque brown and instead of smooth on the surface, it has like spikes, like a submarine mine has. Mm. Uh, it was really bizarre. So that helped. And then I did what I now call protocol M1000A, uh, which to from Jim Humble's book, 1000, is you take the uh, drops, three drops each hour. And I do the first hour, I do the three drops. And then the second, you know, after the first time, I, the first hour later, I do the three. But then after that, I go to every half hour because I can actually feel them using up the uh, CLO2 that that develops so that you need to hit them more often. And then during that time throughout the day, I just did one when we started, I do a zeolite pill because part of what they're built out of is heavy metals and nuclear metals. So that surrounds them and takes them out of your body. And then when I finish at the eighth hour and that last hour, I don't do one on the half hour. So at the, the seventh hour, I do one and then I don't do one on the half hour. I give my body a little bit of a rest. And then one hour after I finish that protocol, I do a mud mix, which is a tablespoon of activated charcoal, a tablespoon of betonite clay powder, a teaspoon of zeolite and a teaspoon of diatomaceous earth. The diatomaceous earth shreds them throughout your entire digestive tract, especially your gut where the hatcheries are. 
zeolite again surrounds them. The activated charcoal actually creates what's called reverse dialysis in your, mm -hmm. in your intestinal and your digestive tract as it goes through and it pulls toxins throughout your whole body as it goes through through your entire digestive tract. It's extremely powerful, especially after doing the protocol 1000, a lot of people, especially doing that much, get what's called a Hertzum reaction. You get very toxic and ill and you get diarrhea. This keeps you from getting diarrhea. In fact, without uh, the, the protocol 1000, you would be um, with that much charcoal, you begin in constipated. So you're right on the edge of that, but it, your stool is very small now and it's black. That's the weird thing. Um, and, but it keeps a lot of the nausea down and it, it absorbs the toxins throughout your whole body really powerfully. And then again, the Bakelite clay also surrounds all other toxins and helps remove fungus as well. So if you have candida or any of these other things that really the M1000, the, the 1000 and, and Jim Humble in his book even goes into, if you have fungal infections, the one thing NASA had said that, you know, that protocol with this and all of the, what makes that CLO2 um, is, a, is a panacea. It pretty much gets everything except some funguses. It, and it actually breaks up the biofilm of what, as well. And then, um, so I do that one after hour after I finish the protocol M1000A, I do the mud mix and then I wait one hour. And there's a guy named, if you, have, you can get him on your show, he's probably the expert in the world on Mergellans and how it ties to demonic activity and Satanism and oh, the black goo and everything is that um, I do a probiotic. You wanna reestablish your gut health and then I, 15 minutes, you know, one hour after the mud mix, the probiotic, I do a tablespoon of probiotic and then not milk based. And then I do 15 minutes later, I eat. And then in the morning I eat, you want to eat two hours before you do the M1000A protocol. Yep. And before you do that, uh, you also want, I do a pill pack in the morning and I, when I eat and in the evening when I eat. also in the morning before 15 minutes before I eat, I do a pro, the probiotic again, because you want to make sure your immune system's getting fueled all the time after you, especially after you finish that um, four day liver gall or salt water cleanse plus the CLO2 destroys your gut health. So you want to reestablish your gut health. So you can get the nutrition out of your food. To, so your immune system, when you're asleep at night, can fight this. And then there's another thing for the topical outbreaks that I do, which is an essential oil. People can email me for that. It's kind of complicated, but that kills them in your skin where the outbreaks are. And it helps keep, it massively decreases the pain from the stinging, burning and itching and cuts the itching. It stings when you first put it on for about two minutes, slightly more than what you have, but then it's gone. And the other thing I found is a, a, a soft washcloth with distilled water in it to you know, touch, slightly, lightly touch it to cool it down to take the sting and the burn out. That helps as well. Mm -hmm. And then um, again, Right before bed, I do the zeolite pill. In the middle of the day, I do a zeolite pill in the beginning. But in the morning and when I eat, in the evening when I eat, I have a pill pack that I designed because I do the zeolite selenium. It helps disturb them as well as inhibits the viral activity as, as does quercetin. And then glutathione also inhibits them and destroys them. And then I also do vitamin E, which also is, helps your immune system and um, massive amount of vitamin C. I do three grams in the morning and three grams at night. And I try to get as much of the, I have what's called a live vitamin C here in the US that is pure vitamin C. It's a bit pricey. You can kind of supplement half if you want or 75% with ascorbic acid, which is a distillate of vitamin C. It's not true vitamin C, but it still does help some. And then I take the quercetin and the glutathione and I do that pill pack every morning and night. And then when I get, you know, also I found out that, you know, to not do the alfalfa powder, like I was saying, when you do a bath, don't do it in as hot of water as you can stand, medium warm water and take hay or, you know, if you make sure whatever cubes or pills you're using, don't break up. But I take the hay and I first wash it off to make sure all the powder's out and soak in that. And then I take a bath and wash it off a shower. Um, and I also found where you have outbreaks, if you're taking a shower and it doesn't have a shower filter that removes chlorine and fluorine, they love chlorine and fluorine. It makes it burn like fire. So in what I do is I have a big 40 ounce bottle of distilled water 
And if I get any regular tap water, um, since I'm only outbreak above my uh, midriff line, my sternum level, mm -hmm. um, I don't get that part wet, but I wash that with this, the outbreak area with the still water. And then where I'm out broke, I pat it with a towel, not rub it. So you don't make the, the lesions worse and break out more. And then, you know, it's interesting every morning when I have my movement and I get up, you can actually, because you're getting small things from the size of like no bigger than a golf ball down to the size of a pea, but they're kind of long, like a grain of rice. And um, you can actually see the mud mix has taken some of the fibers. You can see fibers sticking out in your stools in the little pieces. So it's, you know, that mud mix is extremely powerful. And then the essential oils on the second week, I could actually feel it. Um, they live off your nerve energy. A lot of people have been told it's shingles. It's not shingles. It's Mergellans. And they take your nerve energy. That's why they're on one side of their body. They use the nervous system that runs down one side. Mm -hmm. And they also use your brain energy. The first week I was so bad, I had to crawl up and down the stairs because I couldn't stand up anymore. I was getting so dizzy because they're stealing all my energy. And God told me, I gave the energy to you, demand it back. So I did a workout, I, you know, not enough to sweat, but I do some knuckle push ups and some, then I wait and do some V sit ups. And that actually made me able to walk. And then demanding that that energy is my right from God, that God gave me that energy. It's not for them. So then when you do that, that helps as well. And then another thing I found out with the lesionary is the old, um, you know, moms, my mom used to do this when I was growing up. We know, you know, you take oatmeal and you can do an organic oatmeal bath and then make sure you dry yeah. up, shower off before it dries or put a pack on your skin. And then before it dries, wash it off with distilled water again or a filtered water that makes sure you don't have chlorine or fluorine. In. And, you know, those things have made the difference. And then I've also found I can't for the first two weeks, I couldn't sleep for three days straight at all. I was in so much pain. And for me, with my martial arts, the energy, the pain energy gets so high that I found to, to diffuse it by doing iron fist and tiger claw and concrete helped. Uh, for those that can do that, that helps or do a workout and get the energy from the pain out of your body. Uh, enough, just don't sweat because it burns like crazy when you sweat. And it's difficult to get the salt out from your sweat and toxins from your skin out of the, the lesions. Mm -hmm. But then um, additionally, I found finally that in the beginning, I could actually tell with this new strain that came, like I said, from somebody who had the the uh, thing they put in your arm now with a needle um, that many, many people are getting it because of their concerns about what's going around that came from China, um, that this stuff is different because I didn't get on the four day saltwater cleanse. I usually get their hatcheries out, which looks on other outbreaks like a puffball mushroom the size of a golf ball that's broken open and white. This time what I got on third, the fourth day of the cleanse was the same size of a golf ball, but it's opaque brown, kind of semi-translucent, transparent. And it had spikes like a submarine mine. And so it's a different critter. And it came from a guy that was working on my backyard fence. And he, you know, I gave him a tip because he did such beautiful work. And um, he put as a thank you, he just kind of like, you know, brother, thank you put his right hand on my neck and my shoulder. And that's exactly where it outbroke. And he had gotten that um, thing they put in your arm. Mm -hmm. and so this stuff feeds off sunlight. It has a different hatchery. The other thing that Jairo Calsvela, he's the world expert on these things. He said that uh, a couple things that really were instrumental in my awareness of this was they have a 28 day cycle. So I shortened my saltwater liver gallbladder cleanse to every three weeks instead of every four weeks because you're not beating their hatchery cycle. If they hatch out, you have to deal with a new crop. It's like if you have, you know, uh, in the submarines, we always get scabies because if somebody gets it, then you, your blanket drops on the floor or somebody else, you can pick up the wrong blanket, you get it. So you have to do it, you know, and then you redo it as the new right as the new ones hatch out in this case you want to beat that hatchery cycle and so i do it now every three weeks and then another thing that he said which has been true for me for almost a decade and i i just thought that i was in really really good shape and had really i run low blood pressure 
and low body temperature. I've always been for, oh, it started about 10 years ago, 94.7 body temperature instead of 98.5. He actually said that exact number. If you're running cold, 94.7, you have severe Magellan's. And so that's another thing I've learned is to not allow myself to get cold. They like cold. Yeah. Um, I tried to burn them off in the main part in my skin with liquid nitrogen. It caused mm -hmm. a massive outbreak the time before. And so I don't, don't use cold. Don't allow yourself, keep yourself warm, either get a space heater for the room you're in or blankets or a down sleeping bag or something to keep yourself warm. It's really, really important. And then the last thing I found is, you know, they love the night and I could tell in the basement and a closet when the sun goes down, when the sun goes up, because the pain goes up when the sun goes down massively and down when the sun comes up. So I had to sleep during the day. And I found that sleeping, sitting up is much easier with these, that they don't like that. And then finally, when you get over it towards the end of it, you can start laying back down and ease your way down into a fully reclined position. But sleep sitting up is the easiest way to go at first, even though you don't sleep quite as well and you don't get into the deep theta rhythms uh, or the, you know, as easily into REM sleep either. But it, you need to have sleep. And even if it means napping during the day or whatever you got to do. And then there was a test we found that is absolute proof that you have it which is you can take, get tart cherry juice concentrate at the store and get it like a white bowl or cup. So you can see this when you get done, you swish it around in your mouth for 10 minutes. And you also wanna have some kind of like uh, mouthwash, organic mouthwash, because of, if they're in your enamel of your teeth, it's gonna, they're gonna try to get out into the tart cherry juice. Mm. So it's gonna make your teeth hurt. So you swish it around for 10 minutes, you spit out in the bowl, and then you take an eyedropper on the, and drop a few drops of either vodka or Everclear. And they hate, the alcohol kills them and they'll stream away from the alcohol. You can see lines and streams of nano dust and fibers. And if you take a black light, they'll actually off, oftentimes light up. And then additionally, um, some people have actually even seen black goo coming out of their mouth. That's when you're really bad off. You can actually see they're creating the black goo where they are kind of their parent, so to speak. And so, um, you know, it's a lot. Of, and then the last thing I found is doubling up on my B12. You can also put B12, liquid B12 into that cup or bowl and they'll stream away from that and it kills them as well. So I've doubled the amount of B12 I take every day. So I actually take about 4,000 milligrams a day. And I found some people get a re allergic reaction to it, means you have a synthetic B12. You don't have a natural plant source derived B12. You want to get make sure if you're getting that reaction, it means dial back your B12, but find a different B12. You don't have the real stuff. So, I mean, that's, it's a lot of things I learned that um, is now made me so I can be here today. So thank you, Taino. <laughs> Sounds good, Gene. And Gene, for the for the public, could you mention the um, expert name and the temperature when we run, and the uh, you know the um, I, I don't want to say critical temperature, but that temperature when we run and it's below or ninety. You just mentioned ninety something. That's a case where you do have milligens. Yeah, if uh, in Fahrenheit and the conversion for Fahrenheit to Celsius. Mm -hmm. Um, Fahrenheit, there's many more degrees. So you're going to divide by nine and then multiply by five, and you're going to subtract 32 because Fahrenheit zero yeah. uh, freezing water is at 32, where in Celsius it's zero, zero. So when you do that, you get Celsius, but it's 90, normal body temperature is 98.5. And if you have Mergellans, you're 94.7. Hmm. Okay. And what's the uh, gentleman's name again, uh, Gene? Harold, H-A-R-R-A-L-D, okay. Kaus, K-A-U-Z hyphen Vela, V-E-L-L-A. Okay, perfect. And did you use, well, obviously, I, I guess, at what point were you able to use your Qigong techniques? My what? Uh, Qigong. Kilo? Oh, sorry, you know, Qigong. Oh, my Qigong. Yeah. Yeah, um, I did that right away because I couldn't even walk. And I did knuckle push-ups on the concrete. 
I do as many as I can do, which right now is not a lot because I dislocated my shoulder. If people remember a while back too. So I can only do about 30. And then I would wait about four or five minutes to cool. So I'm not sweaty. And I would do about 120 V setups that I do different kinds. I do where I come straight up with my body to my knee, my legs. And then I also do where I split my legs out. I do 10 of each. And then I do where I, I bring my knees up to my chest. And then I have where I bring my knees to my right shoulder and alternative to my left shoulder. I do 10 of each kind. Then I have do like frog kicks with my legs going in, frog legs with, with my legs going out in circles then with my legs veed out, but coming up to my shoulders. And then the last one, uh, just straight to my chest with my knees. So it's about 120 mm -hmm. total. And it also helps, I found, you know, when you're doing- When the, you upload, yeah. sorry, you're doing Jim Humble's Protocol 1000. Um, sorry for the slip there. Um, no, no worries. Have, no worries. It, you, it helps to pump the stuff through your gut. Sounds good. Excellent. So, you know, people- these were genes, you know, techniques and personal accounts on how, to, you know, to properly heal uh, with melanjones. So I did ask Gene actually next to go over his document, the NNA, so Negative Alien Agenda. Last time we saw, you know, some information from Archons, uh, Nibirus, all right? And um, we talk about, you know, the different timelines. So, uh, Gene, would you mind of, you know, sharing to the public again um, that part of the, the document? Probably, I would say, like, you know, somewhere between, I'm just going to check something, some place between, last time I know we stopped at Morris and Cirrus, so... I'm not remembering which document this is. I have a lot. <laughs> oh, that's the Anunnaki NNA. Oh, okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, I can get that. So if you can unshare screen so I can look at my sure. documents here. Okay, that, that's not hard to find then, as long as I know the name. And then did we talk about what was previously, I don't know if we did on your platform because I've been kind of out of it, sorry. Um, did we talk about what happened in Antarctica? No, but I heard the news, so you may yeah. jump in. Jump, you may jump uh, directly, Jane, on it. Yeah. So in Antarctica, and I had a email from somebody at um, what's its name now, Camp Myrtle, Big Myrtle, which is the U.S. base there in Antarctica, that um, they have seen a lot of as well they had a lot of earthquakes mm -hmm. uh, ice quakes in actuality mostly but earthquakes as well but they've seen a lot of the dark fleet sheep ships the, what they think all of them leaving uh from various locations as, especially from base 211 which is new father uh that the nazis created it between 35 and the towards the end of world war ii yeah. And so that has now, and then they left the Alpha Dracos left with the, the fourth and fifth right types. Uh -huh. And so the lower level, uh, they don't look at as worthy. So Camp McMurdo, he said he was seeing a lot of German speaking people showing up, just showing up out of nowhere, wanting passage, you know, either by ship or by plane to Chile and Brazil where they, uh, there's a, an NAZI contingent there. So they were um, a lot of earthquakes. They're destroying what they left behind because they couldn't take everything. They, during mm -hmm. the, eclip the past eclipse over the other pole, they opened up through the center of the earth a portal that goes from one way from earth to Mentaka. So they were fleeing through that because the Draco are Alpha Draco are very um, resource conscious. So if a investment does not pan out to be worthy of the cost yeah. for buying, it's like when you get a stock, you want to sell when it starts leveling off. If you, it's going up and up and up and up and up, the value is going up and up and up, you keep your investments, but if, and you can keep putting more in. But when it starts to level off or starts to drop, and that's what they've seen with their investment of what, it's taking to hold earth yep. is now not worth what they're getting. They have other planets where they've off trafficked humans 
So the earth is no longer worth trying to maintain. So what they're doing is they're now um, left and they left behind just the lower levels of the NAZI and the non-primes and those. Most of the primes, almost all of the primes are now gone. There's very few left. Mm. And then Chile, um, they, the other German speaking went to Chile and Brazil where in the Andes on both sides, they have entrances into dumps there where in ACI contingents as well as in Brazil, there's actually, um, you know, in Brazil and Argentina, I actually have a person that had seen Hitler um, in the 40s, uh, late 40s, and, and even again in the 50s. And so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So um, the Chinese now, the Turkish, the US and several other countries are going down with large contingents of military and hardware things trying to salvage if there's anything left and to take over the areas they abandoned. So there's a large influx now of people coming through the McMurdo as well as the British bases and all the, you know, and the Chinese, every country essentially has their bases there. You can see where McMurdo is down on the tip there. Um, it, if you see the far tip, it's you can see in red there, McMurdo. It's yep. right there. Yeah. Yep. So it's a large influx. That's something really significant um, going on as far as the uh, negative groups here. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, you mentioned uh, dark, dark, some dark fleet, right, were emerging and escaping. That right. actually was from the... Uh, that's related to the uh, the holes that you know has been uh, disclosed a few a while ago. Yeah, where they have some black holes over there. Yep. Uh -huh. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So thank okay, you. Okay. So did you want to go into the other things, or do you want to cover some more news? Oh, if you have some news, you we can we uh, can mix them up. You had the thing you shared before we started talking on the show of the what happened in Haiti. Oh, sure. So allow me to check this, Gene, and we could go back then again. Yeah, we could go document. back to the document. I got it queued up now. Okay, sounds good. So, yeah, I do want to share this. So a lot of people heard it. So this, the assassination of the Asian uh, president. So uh, Gene's going to give, you know, the military intel. Yeah. Uh, something that the public may not be really aware. So we're not going to go, you know, on who did the thing, but how. So Gene, please go ahead. Yeah, so most people know what the Clinton Foundation has done in Haiti and the cabal with the uh, weather war and earthquakes as well did, did, did to Haiti. So as um, Trump said when he, you know, was at a dinner um, shortly before he got elected, it, you know, Hillary knows that it takes a village, and in the case of Haiti, she's taken many. And what people, a lot of people, don't know is there was a large meteor bombardment uh, about 165 million years ago. It created what are called the Finger Lakes as well as a bunch of other things of uh, Alpha Draco crashing their ships into the ice sheets to melt them, which mm -hmm. caused what is called the Younger Dryas extinction where the ice caps, the ice sheets of the ice age melted in a single day and drove a wall of water 2000 feet high to the equator, which has a bulge of about 2000 feet sea level at the equator because of the torque and the spin of the earth, sea level at the equator is 2000 feet high than it would say be at Halifax in Canada. So mm -hmm. that cold water hitting the equatorial water bowls caused a refractory wave a mile high that went across the uh, American continent and drove into extinction the horses, the mammoths, the saber-toothed tiger. That's why when they laid the Alaska pipeline, they found a permafrost two to 400 feet deep, depending on your location, uh, frozen solid flat mm -hmm. frozen suddenly because the, when the ice was melted by the ships crashing in the meteor bombardment as well that they used um and that's why all the finger lakes are exactly at 28 degrees and exactly the same size because those are ships the in the uh, haiti area they use meteors and down in the equatorial regions in the upper areas they wanted to use their ships because they can get hotter 
And so that water then rushed across the continent, had winds at the speed of sound in front of it, and it tore everything down. And then the ice that was thrown up the air, first it caused a sudden melting, and then the ice caused it to go right back into a uh, thousand more years of um, so the water levels went drastically up and then drastically down in a thousand more years of the ice age. But, and that's why the animals were in, and, and Antarctica was instantly frozen solid. That's why they can find mastodons and saber tooth tigers with food still in their mouth. They were quick frozen, they were swept up. They didn't even have time to do anything in there. And there as the wave red, lost its velocity in, Af in um, South Africa, Antarctica, and in the course, in the case of our area in Alaska and Siberia, then that those waves ran out and they dropped everything where they are and it became permafrost frozen. And so the meteors that struck in the Haiti area, of course, they had brought them in with gravity drive systems, but those meteors were actually, in the case of Haiti, is uh, pretty much very close to refined iridium which is very um, valuable um, and as well as several other rare earth metals are in that. Mm -hmm. So they have been seeing since this assassination and even before he was trying to stop that as well as the stuff they put in your arm with a needle. Haiti has had nobody having that. Nobody has gotten that. And, and Jane. So, yes, sir. Uh, I do have family members over there and uh, when everything was exposing, over there, it seems as you know, it was on a different timeline. Uh, there was no such cases. Yeah. yeah, because they didn't play that game and they didn't play that. And you have mostly humanity there. And I've gone into the differences of humanity and mankind and how it responds to what goes in your arm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this they were he wasn't allowing that just like in Ghana, that president was also assassinated. Why? Same reason because you have huge values of people that are human and you have huge values of iridium and rare earth metals from those meteor bombardments. And yes. you have somebody who's not doing the cabal uh, bidding as far as the stuff that goes in your arm. And so mm -hmm. they decided, you know, as they will, that if you're not gonna do this, they'll get rid of you and put a puppet in your place. So, and they wanted the, those rare earth metals and iridium and people have been seeing many, many trucks. I don't know if you talk to your people, seeing trucks with military trucks, big, huge trucks, you know, earth moving trucks with black dirt and black, you know, ores coming out of that and being loaded onto ships to go to refineries. And those mm -hmm. are the rare earth metals that are extremely uh, a non-terrestrial source, but extremely valuable. Mm-hmm. I got you. And um, other thing too, Gene, before we jump to uh, the engine part, you know, whenever there is public assassination, right, Gene? Um, what we're seeing, you know, probably within the uh, first 48 hours, um, it's one thing. But, you know, the whole, the whole design of it, it's completely different. Could you, if you're allowed to, would you be able like to share, you know, the military... I'm going to say design ops whenever some events has to go down like this. Yes, what they usually do is they have an assassin team like they had with Kennedy, where it's actually, if you watch the, the movie A Rich Man's Trick, you have a six-man hit team and you have a point man who's the guy in Kennedy's case with the umbrella. So you have somebody says now by doing some type, open the umbrella, for example, or tap it on the ground three times mm -hmm. then you have a crossfire situation um uh it could even be in the person's home mm -hmm. and so you have a crossfire where they're caught in a crossfire and they can't get out of it so in the case of kennedy you know it was on a wound of death symbol and you'll find that in this that there are some symbols that are the ruin of death which um most people thinks the peace symbol if you look at the trade towers, for example, they yeah. had built into them the that the steel framing as it went up from the first floor went into the ruin of death, which is like if you hold just your first three fingers and hold your little finger with your thumb down, you mm -hmm. get that symbol. And so that's the not the NAZI rule ruin of death 
And if you look at the boulevard where Kennedy was coming, it's built on the ruin of death. And he was right at the end of that. So you have the man on the grassy knoll, the overpass, the man that actually got the kill shot was in the storm drain and shot him. And that's why he went backwards and to his left and upwards because the shot came from down right of him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the driver had a nickel-plated revolver, as everybody knows in the Magruder film, and they think that's the shot. But the shot would have been on the left, not the right. And his brains wouldn't have spilled out on the back of the trunk of the car. On the left, it would have been on the right. And you could see Jackie O was sitting to the left of him. Pick, uh, now, you know, at that time, Jackie Kennedy was picking, trying to pick up the brains because when you're in shock, you do that. You try to put the stuff back in the person. You're just trying to do what you can do. Yeah. Trying to put things back together the way you can when you really care about somebody. So this is exactly the same type of thing. You have a point man and a six man uh, assassination squad and they come in and they have when they know the point man says does some symbol or a radio signal or it could be just a tap or a click mm -hmm. or something. Then they go out and they go in and do this six man coming in. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Gene. So next uh a lot of people actually read it hear it so first of all i just want to say that you know uh being an indigenous natural person i know gene is one of the um you know the people that's disclosure a lot of intels you know on the net gene is one of i'm gonna say the few that really uh give respect or even you know bring forward information to indigenous people so gene thank you for this now you're, we've seen in unmarked graves, you know, have been appearing there and there. We're not going to talk about, you know, why they found the thing, but really what's going on beyond the scenes. So, Gene, please go ahead and drop your intel, please. Yeah, so that's, this is a tip of a massive iceberg, especially in Canada. Um, there's been a nunnery. There's been lots of Native American areas. Um, in Halifax, there was one. In Nova Scotia, there was one. In Vancouver, there was one. There was this one. Um, they're essentially on every place you're going to have a large grouping of Native Americans living. You're going to find where you have these mass graves. In this case, you know, 215 children. And the one, there was a nunnery in um, Ontario, as well as another nunnery and an adoption agency in the eastern coast of Canada where they found this. And if they start looking, they're going to find this everywhere. You find a Native American, a uh, large assembly of Native Americans living, not just in Canada. You'll find this in Mexico and you'll find it in the U.S. too, because, uh -huh. but especially in Canada, because the, the, uh, queen, the previous queen, she's not the queen anymore, but the previous queen of England would come over to Canada. And so what these elites do is what is called a hunting party. They get their foxes and you know that what they say they're foxes they're not foxes they're what you see put in the ground here they get yeah. children uh, naked and they do a satanic ritual and then the rest of them they let loose and they go after them with their horses and hounds and they do hunting parties that's why you see the rothschilds and all of this with hunting compounds in australia new zealand i mean all over the world their big stuff was in the UK and upper parts of Europe and Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Germany, mm -hmm. especially in Germany, because that's their home. The yeah. queen is actually German, is Germanic. She's Bavarian. She's a, of the Saxe Coburg, Coburg Gotha, which is the same lineage of Vlad the Impaler. So that tells you the kind of group she's in. It's what is known as the Khazarians that came down to earth in the steppes of Central Asia. They're not from here and yep. they're not Jewish. They went into the Jewish people because they found them extremely brilliant and talented and a perfect place to hide where you could have a group that no matter where they're displaced to will rise to the top because they're talented, intelligent and gifted and very devout to God. And they wanted to get in and have that image and so finally, the uh, czars at the time threw them out of Russia because of their Satanism and their child sacrifices like we see there. They mm -hmm. demanded them to leave. And so they de vowed on retribution to the czars, which we saw happen with the elimination of the czar. 
uh, lineage almost completely with only one uh, daughter surviving that that got away uh, thanks to a person that got her out of there a uh, guard. But other than that, the, and she's in hiding to this day and part, actually part of the Alliance and has a lot of inf information. The Rasputin was the person that betrayed the Tsar's family. He was a, a warlock and a black witch for the satanic, the, the highest witch, which was called Rex at the time, the highest uh, male representative going directly to Satan at that time on earth. Um, it's called Spartacus or Res Rex or Pindar is the re the the human like uh rep more mankind like um you know distortion of creation kind of thing uh warlock that's doing this stuff to children every day and consuming the remnants so you know incredibly evil people and so this they would come to canada uh, frequently with their hunting parties and have a big um essentially a blood orgy and then they would have these hunts indeed and uh to the people when jean mentioned the uh you know the previous queen when uh she came here to uh, you know with their groups whatsoever and they were doing the hunting parties that actually that movie is disclosing actually you know um image for image uh scene by scene you know what exactly was what exactly were being you know uh being done uh to the uh you know to the victims and the individuals so thank you gene without being said gene we're gonna go back again to your document the anunnaki sure. nna all right yep so let me share here uh you need to give me share sure I will right yeah. away. So, you know, while you do that, um, it's just, you know, when I first started researching this 30 years ago, I knew there were satanic. I just didn't know how incredibly massive what they've been doing to humanity yeah. is and how many children they do a, a day worldwide. And when the dumps in Africa, South Africa and Africa started getting cleared out, the number that's down there. No, I can't even say the number because there's nobody on earth would believe me except maybe you privately of how many uh, young people are down there underneath that. It's it's a number that's so vast that people go, there's not that many children on earth right now. And, you know, there's there's as many children down there as there are up here. That's mm -hmm. how bad it is because they're multi-generational and they continuously take them from underprivileged areas, Native American areas throughout the Americas, from Haiti, from all over the world, third world countries and throughout Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, you know, every country you can name down there. Um, so all the countries in Africa were, you know, like we have pogroms going on now, like they did in Russia, they did pogroms to create the Democratic Party and have a massive outflux of people from to, into the U.S. Uh, and in Poland, they did the same thing. And uh, even the term Wayfair for Wayfair magazine, people know that scam, yeah. where they were selling them through there. The term Waif came from the UK, where they would go and grab homeless children. The African slavers would first go through Europe and grab children in Europe in the UK and take them down to Africa and sell them mm -hmm. to slavers there. And then they would go into the native areas and grab everybody take hold the whole villages of uh, zulus or you know and wipe out first they went for the zulus because you know that's why they distorted the flag the the map excuse me they mm -hmm. made the equator down only one third up instead of in the middle to mm -hmm. make africa look small because chaka was uh, extremely and his mom and his sister who actually ran the war that was a matriarchal society. Most people don't know that, that the women ran the war, the men went to war. So they had battle plans and everything were drawn up by his sister and his mom who ran the tribe and everything and ran the Zulu warriors. And um, they were extremely educated and intelligent. So if they had seen a real map, if you look at a, a Peter's projection, you'll see that Africa is literally, and in square acreage, you can see this, is the size of all of Europe and Asia put together. It's massive, but on a map, it doesn't look it. And you can mm -hmm. real easy distortion to see is that Australia from east to west is the exact same distance as the U.S. 
But if you overlie, if you cut, on a, cut out a Mercator projection map and you measure the distance, take a caliper and just measure Australia and put it over the US east to west, it's one third short because of that one third distortion. And mm -hmm. I noticed this when I was in the Navy in my first submarine and we went to uh, Singapore. And when we went below the equator, it's like we hit a current. And I got up and I went and checked with the quartermaster, you know, the quartermaster and, you know, how much we'd done overnight. And I go, is there a massive current? He goes, no, it just has to do when you cross the equator that you do use different great circles and things like that. It has to do with how maps are made. And I go, yeah, in other words, distorted. He goes, no, no, no. I go, yeah, right. <laughs> Unless there was a current, we didn't suddenly start doing six knots less all night long. If we've been doing 18 knots the whole way since we left Japan and we're still doing 18 knots, we don't suddenly make less distance unless we have a six knot head current. Right. You know, and so I picked up that and I started that's that was back in 74 that I started the research on the maps because that's what, you know, part of what started waking me up more and more of the started piling up of things that weren't fitting what makes any kind of sense at all. And so, you know, it went into uh, researching what we're being told with space programs, too. It's like, you know, I'm watching them dance around on the moon and I'm going, something's radically wrong with this picture. They're jumping down a hill. And if the gravity is one sixth, your muscle strength goes up as the inverse square, which means if you can gently jump up at say two to three inches, six times that's 18 inches, that's a foot and a half. They're not getting a foot and a half to two feet off the ground. They're, bare, they're, they're just like double what they should be. So it's like it's a 52% gravity or 48% somewhere in there. And that actually is the case. There's a slight atmosphere on the moon. You can see the dust when they first landed hangs there for quite a long time. It's 15 minutes before it all settles. In a vacuum, what's keeping it up? It would fall very quickly. It would settle very quickly. So I'm looking at that. I'm looking. There's a lot of things. And then the first time the orbital went around the backside of the moon at 75 miles up, they adjusted it to 150 miles. I mean, if you went there with a certain amount of fuel, that cuts your stay time. That's got to be extremely important. It turns mm -hmm. out on the backside of the moon, the towers, the, the transparent aluminum towers and titanium and steel towers are still up from the war. Some of them weren't knocked down. On this side, they were knocked down by particle beams from Lemuria when the, the war between Atlantis and Lemuria. But on the backside, you can't hit them. And so a lot of them are still up unless they took them down by ships and they had towers that were a hundred miles high and 125 miles zipping past the windows or <laughs> like, Whoa, what was that? Oh no, there goes another one. NASA they came out. We have yeah. a problem. You know, we don't want to do that again. We might get whacked. So yeah. they moved them up because of that. <clears throat> so they're, you know, I started becoming aware. And as finally I had my epiphany in 1990, I had a, <clears throat> a uh, spy guy that actually a spook that sh hacked into NASA and showed me a live feed from the backside of the moon bounced off a satellite of the lunar rover driving under a dome around a lake. <laughs> and I'm like, and there was stuff all over. <laughs> it was like stuff all over the backside of the moon. Is this live? And he goes, yeah, I go, there's stuff everywhere. He goes, yeah, that's how there is. I mean, it, there's no, the reason they, the, the, you know, the not, the NAZIs had to make a deal with the Draco, there's no available property of real estate up there. You got a bargain to get a, a patch of ground to build on. That's how they built their, their swastika shaped base was they had to bargain with the Draco because there's not a patch of anything that's not up there that wasn't already spoken for. And so Indeed, you know, huh? that's what got me into learning all about our solar system. And you know, I go I go to the observatory uh, or the the you know, and they go through the planets as they do, and they're looking for life. And they say, "Oh, there's no life here. There's no life there." They go by Ceres, like we talked about before, and they go, "Well, there's water, and you know, and you, like I showed you in the picture, and there's greenery here, but there's no life." <laughs> We'll come back. They don't say there's no life. They go, we'll just come back to that later. I'm like, yeah, right. So um, where we left off with Ceres, which is all I did yep. was blow this up and change the contrast and take down you know, the contrast so that it's not hazy. And I get this. 
This is a continent with water and green patches. So, I mean, even the people that go there, they come on the side and they have windows when they look out so they don't see this, that, that it has blue and water, like they said in the observatory. <laughs> look, I mean, come on, how obvious could you be? And then, so our planets again, that we have in our system, um, you know, and this is actually a picture of the ISIS space station. And like I said before, you can already see 4D, 5D Earth, what um, Ashiana Dean, and I like the term median on a war earth, median is fourth density and fifth density life exists here already positive. And <clears throat> cities and everything are already built there. Yeah. Um, there's not many people there. And then for third density positive, they go to Venus, which already, um, as I think I've shown earlier on your platform, has a oxygen atmosphere now, hydrogen, oxygen, atmosphere, neon, um, na nitrogen, like earth. And then it already has completely built buildings. And there's a guy that's doing YouTubes and he's walking around on there and it's the year 2024, but nobody's there. He goes to the airport and there's all the, you know, everything's on, but nobody's anywhere. And it's like, he has cell phone coverage to earth here in 2021. And people are telling him, go here and leave a set of keys. He does, they find it. <laughs> or like freaking out, he's in Madrid. It looks like Madrid. He thinks he's in Madrid. He's actually on Venus for third density positive. Once the rapture happens, people will be taken there by ship for the people that are at third density positive. And the third density negatives will stay here. So you can see the timing is slightly different. Uh, when it's daylight here, this is the same side you're looking at. Daylight shining here. Daylight's not over there because they're actually in a different time zone, so to speak. And so we have, as um, I've gone through, just to reiterate, the first planet is actually Vulcan. And they don't want people to know about this either. Uh, it's in the corona of the sun. It was detected in 1860 by a French mathematician. Uh, he figured it out and then found it by uh, Urbane. Uh, you can probably pronounce that better than I can, Taino, since you speak French. Yeah, so you said it right, Urbane. Yeah, Le Verrier, that's right. Urbane La Verrier? Exactly. Le Verrier? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, he announced the discovery of Vulcan, a planet orbiting between Mercury and the Sun, to the members of the Academy of Science in Paris. He found it through calculations and required its presence and oscillations in the orbit of Mercury. Uh, that explained these oscillations uh, were due previously to sunspot activity. And he showed that it, the large variants were due to this massive, massive planet um, that's in, it's bigger than Earth in the corona of the sun, actually. And then we have Mercury and Venus, like most people know, and Earth. And we have another Earth now that is in orbit. And then mm -hmm. we have Mars and we have Ceres, which is the remnants of Tiamat, um, or Maldek is a, has goes by several names. Gaia is the, the true name of it originally before it was blown up by the war between the Adamite civilization that was on Mars, that the Cabal, the Satanists, again, in the Draco and all that, got them to get involved with the Jovians. And so they exploded in what's left at Ceres. And the most of the uh, water of that planet and the atmosphere created the rings of Jupiter. And then it destroyed most and tore off most of the water of Mars and its liquid core, which is polarized in two pieces. It it's liquid core of its sun. Mm -hmm. It's in the eternal part of it as all planets are hollow. They have a liquid core, uh, heavy metal, nuclear metals, mostly sun and that the two chunks of that that were not nuclear became the Phobos and Danos for the Mars moons. That's why they're exactly the same age as the asteroid belt, which is about 167 million years ago. Or excuse me, 500,000 years ago. I'm thinking to a different event, sorry. So this all occurred about 500,000 years ago. Then you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto and Chidron are two halves of an original planet. So they orbit each other. They were also broken up in that war. And um, it's uh, part of it. Uh, there's an asteroid belt between there, which is part of the mantle of that now broken planet as well, the liquid mantle. And so during the cataclysm, the human race took refuge on another planet in the solar system, which was a moon of, T of Tiamat. And it was called uh, Eden Earth, which was displaced where our Earth is now. 
Mm -hmm. And it, it became what we know as Earth. Um, while the Atlans built a giant space arc, the moon, the Atlans are the, the Martians, and they came, became the Atlanteans and brought in orbit around the Eden Earth 445,000 years ago. The Anunnaki came to the home, and the Anunnaki are from our sister solar system. If you remember, I presented that. Yep. Yep. So that was Nibiru, uh, Argoda, and Helion. Their home planet is Nebru, which is the seventh planet of the Nemesis star system, which is a brown dwarf that orbits, orbits the Earth every 29,720 years. It left our system in 2000, uh, I think it's 19, if I remember correct, early 2019 or late 2018, somewhere in there. Uh, my memory's not too good. I'm still fighting them with Jones here, so sorry, I don't get dates perfect. Um, they came to Earth to mine gold, um, first posing as gods because they hit with the Draco, they're the slaves of the Draco, would take them over and um, force them to serve them. And so they, their atmosphere looks like this. It's completely polluted and dark, much like you see in the movie Matrix. Uh -huh. um, so to reseed their atmosphere, you can make monatomic gold where two of the dimensions of gold are in the etheric or quantum realm. And so it pulls literally from the word of God and reorganizes matter and it can clean up this mess. So they came to earth to get, uh, what's called native gold. You can make gold in a printer, but it's not native gold. Native, whenever grail gold is created, whether it's through transmutation of quartz by picking up uh, more protons and neutrons in the nucleus to become gold, or you put it in a printer, it picks up the quantum signature of where it forms, so it's different. And so like Thai gold is very orange-ish red compared to American gold, and it's a little softer. If it's all the same, how could it have a different color and a different ductility and hardness? And it's also um, American gold is, is a little bit more ductile than the Thai gold. So they posed as gods and came as the rulers of humanity. And they tried to force humanity to mine for them, but it didn't work out too well. So there was what was known as the pyramid wars. So after several centuries of increasingly uh, oppressive treatment that led to the eventual total enslavement of the human race. A rebellion war, war happened. They were enslaving us to mine gold that resulted in what was known as the Pyramid Wars, which is the cause of the destruction of the advanced civilization of Uyghur. And we know about the Chinese enslaving the Uyghurs and what they do. And that's the remnant. That's why the Gobi Desert is a desert. It used to be like the Sahara. That's the other part of that civilization, mm -hmm. a tropical rainforest. And they dropped antimatter bombs and it rained sand for a thousand years and in the Gobi still to this day the winds blow up um, mummies and gold coins and in the Sahara they don't uh, people don't go out there it's too hot but if you're to dig it pretty much anywhere 150 feet down usually 40 feet down in the sand you can find artifacts and building remnants and things so this, these lush rainforests are what's, you know, originally and this vastly advanced civilization of human, the humans were vastly advanced, way more than we are now. And um, the anti bowler bombs caused this advanced civilization to come to an end. And so humanity fled up into the Himalayas and uh, up into the upper parts of where the Chinese now tortured them uh, because they, you know, hated what, humanity is <clears throat> so here's you know a rendition of them uh destroying the pyramids which had to be rebuilt and mm. uh were and gene yes sir what's even uh trickier uh we talk about this last time is you know you have different faction of that same anunnaki group right yes sir mm -hmm. so it gets confusing same with the uh the Ashtar Command, it turns out there's two different factions of Ashtar Command. Mm -hmm. One's good, one's evil. Yeah. So you have these vastly tall Anunnaki and the Draco and their pyramid ships coming down and, you know, legions of demonics, all kinds of things coming in this vast war against humanity. And humanity actually did defeat them. And so they drove the Draco off the planet at the time, the Anunnaki. And so they came back and what they realized is that to try to forcibly 
destroy humanity wasn't going to work. That the trick they have to do, like Carlos Castaneda said, is give us their mind. The mind of a of the Draco is a uh, hierarchical structure in which those above are authority and truth. Uh, authority is not truth. Truth is authority, and so just because you have a bunch of letters or names or you're some royalty lineage doesn't mean you're a good person or that what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. We should always, you know, pray on and research and, and go with what God tells us and what common sense tells us rather than just accepting some talking head on a, on a box in a box or somebody with a bunch of letters behind or in front of his name, Sergeant or General so-and-so just because you're military or whatever doesn't mean you're telling the truth. Yeah. So the Anunnaki then came down and, you know, started getting in positions of leadership and um, just, just showing the results of the Pyramid Wars, the Gobi and the Sahara Deserts. Yes. And where they are. So this, for Africa, was known as, like in the U.S., what is called the, the Grain Belt, where you can at that time was a tropical rainforest. It's great for growing grain and fruits and vegetables, verdant, as was the Gobi Desert. And so they just blasted it to pieces. And then this is the Gobi Desert. Mm -hmm. And the Alpha Drake realizing humans could not be suitably enslaved at that time and uh, that they needed to be infiltrated and slowly genetically dumbed down. Set about to gene genetically engineer a suitable slave mining species because they still needed the gold for the Anunnaki to receive their atmosphere as well as other planets. They've done the same thing. So yeah. the engineering encompassed taking genetics of Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, and the Anunnaki, and the Alpha Draco themselves. Initially, the Alpha Draco wanted to incorporate human genetics, but at that time they found it, they could not. Um, the efforts always failed due to the human genome blocks put in by God. So at that time, humans had O positive, and that block of the RH negative was the finally one. They got the positive out. So they developed A, then they developed B. They were These are results. That doesn't mean you're, you're Alpha Draco or something, or part alien or whatever. It means that you're a result of them trying to remove genetically the blocks that God put in to creating a human hybrid of a human with something else. They couldn't do it with somebody that was pure human, 100% O positive, everything. So RH negative A would be the ones that are most easily, easily hybrided. That's all that means. So people are saying that means you're a Draco or stuff. No, it doesn't. Um, the Alpha Draco abducted a human breeding pair and removed a fertilized egg from the female's womb, in other words, Adam and Eve, and hybridized what they desired. So what they did is they had to completely remove from the egg the human genome first, and then they installed a mixture, and they did this in, 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 in generational situations where they did a first generation, a second generation, trying to up this. After they did Cain, they did 12 more renditions, so you had 13 bloodlines. Cain is the first rendition, then you had the other 12. So they mixed Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, Anunnaki, and Alpha Draco to get the perfect slave miners, the bloodlines of Cain, the 13 Illuminati bloodlines. And so, you know, mm -hmm. you get things like this creature here that is reptilian, like a mask of a, has a, a you know, a hood like a cobra, because you have that Alpha Draco reptilian blood in there. So the royals, uh, what, with Zachary's section, with his you know books and things, he mistranslated the Sumerian scrolls so that it would make it look like humanity was the result of this engineering. When it actually the blood, it's the bloodlines of Cain, which is actually mankind, not humanity. Which so is after, yeah, you're yeah, right, Jay, Which is different, yeah. Yeah. So what they're going to do is show humanity that we were created by the Anunnaki. And yeah, I know a lot of people believe that, and it's not true. Man, that's the case of mankind. And then they would say, see, we have more of that genetics than you do. Well, yeah, because they've been breeding, because when Cain went out of the garden, he found a wife. 
Where did he find a wife from? If that's it in the Garden of Eden, there's nobody out there. What did he mate with? A monkey? <laughs> no, he mated with humanity. So they've been crossbreeding. This is one of the missing books. It's called the Quell books or the Q books. The missing, some of the missing books and the other sermons on the Mount that Jesus Christ did was saying not to intermarry with mankind anymore because there's some significant differences between humanity and mankind. Like they'll make you a promise that I'll always be there for you. And then two years later, you ask them to be there for you and they go, I can't do that right now. It's not convenient. <laughs> well, this is life and death for me. And they go, well, that's your problem. Well, what about your promise? What promise? <laughs> I never made that promise. You tell them, they go, I never said that. They don't remember things. Um, sometimes they, you know, if they're more, the more mankind genetics you have, for example, I had a girlfriend from Japan when I was in Hawaii and she could not smell rain. She could, hmm. we were leaving Bellows Beach on the Air Force Base in Oahu and it had rained. And I love the smell of rain and you know, the pines and the ozone and the rain and the the salt in the air it was gorgeous it was so beautiful and um i go i love the smell she goes go what smell <laughs> i'm like what smell the rain the wet trees the wet sand the salt in the air she goes you can't smell rain i go sure you can that she goes that's water you can't smell water i go in the mountains in the rockies i can tell you every single stream if you were to put me in front of a stream in the Waimanoosh, for example, in, you know, say Elk Creek, yep. and then put me in another drainage. I could tell you it smells different by the minerals and things. That she goes, you can't do that. I go, sure you can. I was like, what's <laughs> wrong with your nose? <laughs> but it turns out that's a mankind characteristic. They have way less, the more human you are, the way more compassion, the way more understanding, the way more you care for your children, you would mm -hmm. never do what the cabal does to their ch own children. They do mm -hmm. the same thing to their children and make them all mind slaves as they do to ours. They're horrific. Um, they're just this creation of the bloodlines of Cain that are the, literally from the bloodlines of the serpent. And so they would, uh, once they got this, these guys were, mankind was forced to mind the gold because it can force us to. And so um, the Anaki would beam the gold up from under the earth by massive stone structures. So if you look in your microwave at the little microwave system, it looks just like that. You have a little microwave energy device that looks, if you open it up and cut it in half, this is exactly what it looks like. You have different renditions of it. They look like these pictures that are all over South Africa. I used to say there's a few hundred, there's a few million. Wow few millions they are massive they're all over the place and so they would take these these microwave and tr turn it the gold into a scalar configuration beam it up and then it materializes in the ship so the miners would bring it up and they put it inside these structures and they would say these are for cattle where's the door <laughs> it's like how do they get back and forth <laughs> How do they get in and out and these walls some of them are 12 feet high and they're made out of dolomite a lot of them, which dolomite, uh, when you you mine it and you cut it, it's white. Uh, it's, as it oxidizes, the outside turns black. So you can mm -hmm. tell exactly how old these are. So you can actually date these structures. The Anunnaki built, it's now not this, I did this a while back. It's no longer tens of thousands of these devices. There's tens of millions. <laughs> if you look at, um, uh, what's his name, Ubuntu movement guy, um, can't remember his name. I'm not doing good for pulling up memories. <laughs> the Magellan Stone. No, it's okay, Gene. It's okay. Yeah, Michael Tellinger. He goes through this on his website. These massive sites. So you can see how many there are. There are just so many. I mean, that's a mass. Imagine the little microwave in your oven. It's a little tiny thing. It's you know hardly yeah. like even like a quarter inch in the big ones. And here, look at this thing. This is these are trees. <laughs> This is massive. Imagine yep. the power that that generates. These giant microwave generators that created the crosswave pattern, uh, which creates scalar transdimensional waves for beam up. So here's your regular microwave system. See the pattern? Yep. Microwave generator. There's another one. Same pattern. There's another one. <laughs> Same pattern, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> A whole bunch of little circles around a big one in the middle. 
There's yes, the same indeed. pattern. There's the same. That's exactly the same pattern. Look, big little holes around a big hole. And look at the height of these trees. And they say this is for putting cattle or people's homes. Where's the doors and windows? <laughs> Mm -hmm. How do you get in? What do you do? Climb a 12 foot wall to get in home? I mean, and look at this. They're just everywhere. So after thousands of years of being ruthlessly enslaved by the masters, their masters, the Alpha Draco and the Anunnaki, the Illuminati bloodlines of Cain learned the ways of their ruthless masters. They were able to infiltrate the human race and subtly take over all areas of human civil civilization and essentially rule the planet until now. And the great reawakening of the human genetics. The Alpha Draco had been able to electromagnetically shut down human genetics from 12 strands that it had when the Anunnaki first came to earth and had blown up Tiamat, it dropped down to where we were you know, a couple, half century ago, which was down to two strands. That's the lowest you can have, because with one strand, there's nowhere to have the information between, um, like a ladder, there's no place for the rungs. Thus allowing them to give humans their mindset, that of power, greed, selfishness, service to self, hierarchical power system, with Satan, the, their ruler and sovereign at the top. The Illuminati 13 bloodlines of Cain began to hate humanity and blame them for their enslavement and horrific treatment by both the Alpha Draco and the Anunnaki. The vast hatred was due to their being forced to mine gold for tens of thousands of years all over Africa. Through the thousands of years of enslavement by the Anunnaki and the Alpha Draco, the bloodlines of Cain learned the ways of their masters to infiltrate and enslave, so they completely learned to emulate their false gods. And this included the worship of their false god, Satan, and all that that entails. However, now this subtle and hidden mind control enslavement is being thrown off by the human race in the great reawakening. We were awake. I don't call it the great awakening. I call it the great reawakening because mm -hmm. we were wide awake when we were the, the Uyghur civilization, the Lemurian civilization. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember the Atlantean civilization is the Atlans primarily, so that's not humanity either. This is due to the orbit of the the great reawakening is due to the orbit of the Milky Way around its galactic core. It's not due to the passing of Nebiru, okay, Planet X. It's not what it's due to. That's only every twenty nine thousand seven twenty years. Um, the Earth and the Milky Way orbits its central sun just like the planets orbit the sun, the sun, we or the solar systems orbit a central sun, Alcyon, which is trapped inside a black hole. That's the case in all falling galaxies. In normal galaxies, the sun is not inside a black hole. The energy of the central sun is because it's in a black hole is forced to come out polar vortexes, which are called the, the cones. Planets have them too, they're just not so obvious. So you have the holes which have the cones coming out of them in the earth. And that's where you see the aurora borealis coming out of the central sun inside the planet. And then you have the rods, which create the electromagnetic fields coming out of the poles. And then the, the lines rotate towards the poles, the, uh, the energy fields. So the energy of the central sun is forced to come out of the polar vortex as the black pole. And it spreads out over the Milky Way in a vast photon ring, it, which is primarily in the wavelength of that central star, Alcyon, which is it's an infrared giant. So the a bit beyond a red giant is an infrared giant. So this all-star system, the galaxies, that um, that thud, sorry, <laughs> that pass um, mm -hmm. uh, through that ring every half rotation because the ring goes across the entire Milky Way, and I have yeah. a, a drawing of that to explain it here in a bit. The energy causes the sun of those systems to increase energy and density, and then. It, they in turn send this to all their planets and life on them. So what causes suns to burn is not nuclear furnace. Otherwise, if you look down in a sunspot, it gets hotter, doesn't it? It gets cooler. They've looked literally 100 miles down. It's almost room temperature. And the jets you see coming out of sunspots are water vapor. The pressure is massive. So even at that temperature, at you know a million degrees Kelvin, you can have molecules. And they even have detected bacteria coming off the sun. 
And so a lot of what they're telling you about things aren't correct. The Illuminati have named this photon belt, the Masonic ring. And it is this ring of energy that is increasing the Earth's sun uh, activity. And this then increases the dynamics of weather on all the planets <laughs> in the system. It has nothing to do with humanity. We, we make greenhouse gases. We make like 0.04% of it. I mean, the... <laughs> It's not hardly anything compared to like during the Jurassic period. Look at methane and, and ozone. It was massive. The whole earth was not a desert. It, the whole earth was a tropical rainforest. Uh, because what do plants do with carbon dioxide? They create more with the sunlight. And then it. what happens when you go in a forest? It's cooler than out in a desert or out in a field. Yes. So it actually creates global cooling, not global warming. So, for the sun.